All right, a uh, little bit of background before we uh, get into this as far as why I'm doing this and what's going on. Um, I heard somebody teach a lesson and it was related to something that I was doing previously back in the fall. And throughout this sermon, they interjected a whole lot of stuff about the kingdom. They just kept making reference to the kingdom. And it's, I've heard the king, I've been in this my whole life. And I don't know how many church services I've sat in throughout the course of my 50 plus years of being alive and being there every week and all, all that stuff. And I've heard about the kingdom. I've probably even read some of the parables and taught on some of the parables about the kingdom. So I knew it was there and I knew it was legitimate, but I heard this guy talk. And even though he wasn't talking about that specifically, he was saying some things. It's like, okay, I don't understand what he's saying. He, he knows something that I don't know. He is operating in this thing with a deeper understanding, a deeper revelation, a deeper experience than what I have ever encountered. So that got me to thinking, I'm like, okay, what else don't I know about the kingdom? And at that point, uh, we were ending the um, faith to uh, ministering and receiving uh, healing. We were entering, ending that class, and I was about to do, I knew I was going to do the biblical citizenship class. And that's funny, too. That's, that's kind of a story in itself. Uh, the whole point of biblical citizenship was uh, how America was set up and what our founders were thinking when they wrote our documents and created our government and all that stuff. And the whole point of all that was to get away from a king and to get out from under a kingdom. It's like, okay, God, you've got a real sense of humor here that that was the last thing I taught. And now I'm going to be teaching about the kingdom. Okay. Ha ha. Funny. Um, so anyway, uh, I got to look in, I got to, to look at some stuff and, and doing some digging on my own. And it occurred to me, how many of the parables did Jesus talk about? The kingdom of God is like such and such. The kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like this. And I could probably quote a lot of those parables, but I never really took the time to figure out what about the kingdom am I supposed to learn from that parable? And I never applied that to my life. What about the kingdom does that thing supposed to do for me? How is it supposed to change my attitude about the kingdom? How is it supposed to make my life different by knowing this, understanding this, operating in this about the kingdom? It's like, I, I'm totally clueless. I'm totally oblivious to the majority of this whole concept, even though I have heard it in part my whole life. I'm like, okay, surely I'm not the only one on this, in this spot, in this place. So it's like I said, I'm on a little quest uh, to figure out what this kingdom thing is about, to figure out how that's supposed to be impacting my life, to figure out what that's supposed to be doing in my life, doing for my life, uh, how, what, what am I supposed to be doing differently as a result of understanding the kingdom? So I'm going to do this and teach myself, and y'all get to come along and enjoy the learning process as I figure this out for me. So when I say that, it's like, I don't have this figured out yet. I don't have all the answers of it yet. And I've been studying really hard the last three weeks since we finally set the date to start it and getting everything ready. And it's like, I'm just being blown away by the magnitude of this and the seriousness of this, what is available there. And I have been totally aloof. I've been totally unaware of what was going on. So welcome to my journey. Uh, and hopefully it'll be beneficial for you as well. And just because it's my journey, feel free to interact, feel free to comment, feel free to uh, inject your opinion and thoughts about it. So let's get into it. Um, I'm going to do this class a little differently than what I've done in the past. Usually I'd get on a topic and I would just go and go and go and go and go until I got done with that topic. And then we'd switch gears kind of in the same thing, but it was slightly different and go and go and go and go and go. Uh, this time I'm gonna do this a little differently. I'm going to go like this session is 10 weeks. And at the end of the 10 weeks, however far we got, we're gonna stop right there, unhitch for three or four weeks, let everybody have a little break and then resume wherever we picked up, where we left off uh, at the end of those three weeks. And we'll do that three, four, five, however many times it takes to get through the whole topic but i figured that'll go better and 
uh, y'all won't feel bound. It's not the right word, but it, it's kind of the way it comes across. Oh, I've got to be there every week because of this and that. No, you don't need a break too. I need a break. Let, let's just plan that into the schedule and, and see if it works better for it this time. Anyway, uh, our theme verse for this particular session, uh, Introduction to the Kingdom, is going to be in Luke 12. And we're going to read this every week and then talk about it specifically at least one of the weeks, uh, what it actually means and what it's actually talk about. Luke 12, 31 to 32, this is from the Amplified. Only aim at and strive for and seek his kingdom. I can stop right there. Only aim at, strive for, and seek his kingdom. Does that just make anybody pause for just a second? Only aim at, strive for, and seek his kingdom. I know in my life, there are a lot of other things that I would say I'm aiming at, I'm striving for, and seeking other than his kingdom. So I've got work to do right from the beginning. And all these things shall be supplied to you. Do not be seized with alarm and struck with fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's your father's good pleasure to give you what? The kingdom. Now, if you were writing this and you didn't know that the word was kingdom there, let's just pause. It's your father's good pleasure to give you blank. What would you think that that blank would contain? To give you salvation, to give you prosperity, to give you healing. There are a bunch of different words you can put in there where that blank would be. I don't think that many of us, if you didn't know that scripture, would default to, it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. There was a story as I started preparing for this that I heard a guy that I listened to talk about frequently. And uh, being that this is Pride Month, you'll probably hear or see some of these things yourself. Uh, this, this guy was on TV at a protest or at a rally or something, and he made the statement, Jesus went about preaching love and acceptance. Have you ever heard somebody say something like that? Jesus went about preaching love and acceptance. Now, the majority of people that say stuff like that, what kind of condition are they in when they say it? They're probably doing things that are not really biblically correct. They're, they're, they're in the midst of sin. They're in the midst of something going on in their lives. So they will make the statement, Jesus preached love and acceptance toward what end? To guilt trip you into not giving them a hard time about whatever junk they're involved in. Isn't that usually the way that that whole scenario plays out? And we've heard it over and over and over again to the point where, okay, I can kind of accept that. Am I the only one that's saying that? Uh, yeah, I guess that's right. Whether or not it actually bears witness with your spirit, whether or not you've actually thought that through. Uh, okay. Okay, good. Right. Right. So love and acceptance. And this guy was listening to one of these news reports one day, and he heard somebody say that. And the Holy Ghost on the inside of him spoke up and said, no, I didn't. Whoa. What do you mean you didn't? Jesus loves us, and we are accepted in the beloved. He doesn't necessarily like our sin, but he loves us anyway, and he'll help us deal with our sin after the fact. We don't have to clean ourselves up completely before Jesus will have anything to do with us. So thank God that we don't have to be perfect, that we can um, belong before we believe, so to speak. Not really technically true, but in, in that sense, but you know what I'm getting at. Anyway... So, no, I didn't. Hmm. Okay, now I've got to do a little research here. I've got to figure out, okay, if that's not what you preached, then what did you preach? If you didn't go about preaching love and acceptance, what did you preach? 
Well, where would we go to answer such a question? Back to the Bible. Let's do some research. Let's see what the Bible actually says about what Jesus preached. We tend to accept stuff like this over time because so many people start saying it. It sounds right because he did demonstrate God's love for us. He said that we were supposed to love each other. After we're born again, we are accepted into God's family. Then we hear things like this, and we need to check it out for ourselves. So many times we just hear it over and over and over and over again, and then it dulls us to the point where that doesn't even alarm me anymore. That doesn't even bother me anymore. Until the Holy Ghost interrupts that equation. No, I didn't say that. Whoa, time out. What did you actually say? Well, let's check that out. What was it that Jesus actually preached? That's what we're going to talk about today. What did Jesus preach? What did Jesus preach? We may go into next week. We may go into the following week with it. I don't know. We'll go as far as we go and take our time and see what happens. Matthew 4, 17. Matthew 4, 17. I've got two different versions here. From that time on, from what time on? The time that he was baptized, the time that he went and went to the uh, wilderness to be tempted, from the time forward that he was anointed by the Spirit for ministry. From that time forward, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Amplified. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent. That means change your inner self, your old way of thinking, regret past sins. Live your life in a way that proves repentance. Seek God's purpose for your life, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Does this talk about love? Does this talk about acceptance? God does love us, but he does not love all of our junk. He will accept us as we are, meaning we don't have to fix everything before he will accept us. But he loves us enough to not leave us in that condition. He will require that we change. He will require that we make adjustments, that we do things differently after we come to know him. And he's kind and he's gracious and he's long-suffering enough to only show us a piece at a time. I am so glad that God didn't, the moment I first came to him, say, okay, son, I'm glad you're in the family now, but you've got 2.7 million things you got to fix in your life. <laughs> We'd be overwhelmed. We'd quit. And there's no point in him doing that because it's just going to destroy us. So how does he handle it? Okay, son, daughter, I'm glad you're in the family. This week, let's work on this. And you'll spend a little bit of time and you'll hopefully get that one right. And you're, you're feeling good about yourself. You're feeling great. And he, oh, you're doing so good. You're doing so well. I'm so proud of you. Now let's work on this. And then you'll work on that one. And then you'll come back to him and he goes, oh, all right, I've got three things fixed. Oh, here's a couple more. It's, it's so merciful of him to not show us our whole mess all at one time. We couldn't handle it. But he does require us to deal with our mess. He does require us to fix our stuff. He's willing to help us do it. He's willing to provide grace. He's willing to provide mercy. He's willing to provide help. Uh, strength, empowerment, whatever we need to overcome it. He's willing to help, but he still requires us to make the effort and do the work to get those things out of our lives. Not about acceptance in the sense of, oh, he just takes me as I am. I don't have to worry about changing. I don't have to do anything differently. Totally different mindset than what this guy in the parade in the rally made Jesus out to be, made Jesus out to sound like he was saying. Well, actually, that would be a lie if you said that's what he said. Correct. Yeah. Correct. But we've accepted stuff like that. As a general society, we, we bought into that lie. The church Here's another version of 417. From that time, Jesus began to preach, crying out, repent, change your mind for the better, heartily amend your ways with abhorrence of your past sins, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Does that sound like Love and acceptance. According to the Bible, what did Jesus preach? Repentance. Why did he preach that? Because the kingdom of heaven was close. 
So in order for you to experience any part of the kingdom, the first thing you had to do was repent. Because you weren't in the kingdom prior to that point. And now the kingdom is available to you or becoming available in this particular time when it was spoken. It is available to us now. Become available. And the only way you're going to enter into it is to change. The only way you're going to enter into it is to accept the work that he did for your sin and then begin the process of dealing with those sins, getting those out of your life. Could it be that repentance is one of the keys that open the kingdom of heaven and or aid its effectiveness? I say that it is. Uh, could it be that repentance is one of the keys that opens the, key, the kingdom of heaven and or aids in its effectiveness? If you refuse to repent, repent, are you even in the kingdom? You're not. And then after you get in the kingdom, if God starts dealing with you about something and you become a hard nose about it, God, I'm not changing that. Is your effectiveness in the kingdom limited? What's going to happen? You're going to keep taking that test and probably failing that test over and over and over again. You don't get to take the next test until you pass that one, until you deal with that issue. There's no point. Right. Yeah, the sin's in the way. Yeah. For the next few verses after Matthew 4.17, Jesus selects his ministry team. He calls his 12 disciples. If you know anything about the Bible, you realize that these guys were far from perfect. Could it be that repentance is one of the keys that open the kingdom of heaven and or aid its effectiveness? So Jesus picks his team. He picks his 12 disciples. They had all sorts of issues. They had all sorts of things going on. They had all sorts of stuff that Jesus had to work out with them, but they were still on the team. There's hope for me. And if you want to look at it, there's hope for you. These knuckleheads still made the team. Good job. Thank God. <laughs> okay, so he picks his team. He tells us who the team, the early team members are. So we'll drop down a few verses here. Go to verse 23, 24. Matthew 4, 23, 24. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. He ended up having a healing meeting, but wasn't advertised as a healing meeting. What was he preaching? The kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom, good news of the kingdom, sorry, good news of the kingdom. And the result was healing. Notice that Jesus took his new team out and proclaimed the good news of the kingdom. When you create a brand new organization, isn't the purpose for that organization as clear as it will ever get? You form a new business, you form a new ministry, you form a new family, you form a new whatever, fill in the blank. The first things that you do under that new organization, aren't they going to be the purest as far as the reason for why it was formed? You don't know any better yet. You don't know that your idealistic view of this thing that you just created may or may not work, that it may or may not pay for itself, that it may or may not get funded, that it may or may not continue to exist. But the first thing that you try is going to be the purest representation of the reason for which it was founded. Does that make sense? So the very first mission that this new team went out and set on what did Jesus preach? The good news of the kingdom. So in his mind, what is the primary focus of him being here? To preach the good news of the kingdom. To make real, to make manifest, to make available the good news of the kingdom. 
If you ask most Christians today, why did Jesus come? What's going to be the answer? To, to save us from our sin. He did come to do that. That was one of the reasons that he came. But the purpose for which he came was to bring the kingdom with him and give us access into the kingdom by what he was going to do on the cross. But the purpose, the point, was the kingdom. Not necessarily the sin. He had to deal with the sin before the kingdom came available, but the driving force was the kingdom. That's good. Can I do an awful lot of things? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I, I take this part here. Uh, refers to what Paul who said that you know, said at one time that I became all things. Win some, right? Right. Now you look at that, that's why opening a new restaurant. Okay, what do you want to do? You want to do anything and everything to get people on the board. I think that's what Christ is doing here. He's trying to be all things to all people. One thing, but his main purpose, like you said, is to tell them that they need to Correct. Yeah. And ideally, I mean, when you create a new restaurant and you've got this new marketing technique, this new gimmick, ideally it will be successful. So you keep doing it. That it's not just a one shot. Okay, we're going to get people in here and then we're going to totally change course. We're going to get people in here and what is a bait and switch? When you, when you do that sort of stuff, you get them in under one motivation and then you change the tables on them while they're there. Is, does Jesus do that? His purpose is to the kingdom. So I'm going to do whatever it takes to get people in to recognize and experience the kingdom. Is he going to deviate from that? That purpose will be the same from then on and on and on and in the future. And the purpose is the kingdom. By, through, whatever means necessary. I'm remembering that in Matthew 24, when they asked him, when he would return, one of the things he says is, and this when this gospel is preached as a kingdom, to the kingdom, preached, the gospel of the kingdom is preached to everyone, right? The end will come. The right, kingdom. not just the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. Yeah, the gospel of the kingdom, preached in all the world, and then the end. And then when, so how are we doing on that? Is it is it the same thing for us to preach the message of Jesus, hopefully all over the, the globe? Versus preach the message of the kingdom all over the globe. He's the only reason there is a kingdom. But, the, but our mandate does not end according to that verse when what we define as the gospel is preached. It says very clearly when the gospel of the kingdom is preached. And what I submit to you is our definition of the gospel is not necessarily the gospel of the kingdom. Yeah. You know, ultimately, the, kingdom, the purpose of the kingdom in Jesus preaching the kingdom is to restore us back to where we should be. And so if we stop short and say, okay, I'm just going to preach the gospel, I hope you get saved, then that just basically punches your ticket to the heaven that time. <laughs> so the, the mandate to preach the kingdom is so that you will be active in the kingdom and take your rightful place. Um, not only as a king or king or queen, but also as a Satan person. Right. Yeah. Right. So that is what yes. We should be doing. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, this will be sprinkled in throughout, and I'll go ahead and mention it now. At, at the very beginning, he gave uh, Adam and Eve authority over all the creation. When they bowed their knee to Satan, they handed over that license, if you will, to him that made him the legal ruler of the earth and all the systems of the earth. What was Adam and Eve told to do? Go out and dominate, really, all the earth. Subdue it. Make it grow. Make it fruitful. Make it, give me a return on my investment from a practical sense, from God's perspective. Yes, over all of it. Well, they lost that dominion when they bowed their knee to Satan. So Jesus had to come and get that dominion back. But the whole thing for all history has been 
God's creation exercising dominion over his creation. Do we see that? God's, God's created man, his highest creation to exercise dominion over the rest of his creation. That was his plan all along. And it got messed up when Adam bowed his knee. So Jesus had to come and fix it. So it makes sense that if that was the plan from the beginning, Jesus had to come and fix it. His primary motivation is to fix it and see it reenacted. And by fixing it, I've got to, I know I've got to go to the cross. To make that happen, I've got to go to the cross. So I'm willing to go to the cross to fix the problem of man not having dominion anymore. A man not operating in the king dumb dominion. Them not ruling, them not reigning over the rest of my creation. And notice that this version says, the good news of the kingdom. Not just the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom. Others say gospel. So gospel of the kingdom. Others say glad tidings of the kingdom. Think about that for a moment. If our version of the gospel is not good news or glad tidings, it doesn't match what Jesus preached. I'll say that again. If our version of the gospel isn't good news or glad tidings, it does not match the gospel that Jesus preached. Have you ever heard hellfire and brimstone sermons? I don't know that you could have survived any denominational church for any period of time and not heard at least one of those in years gone by. Really? Anyway, well, that's kind of a separate issue, but okay. <laughs> have you ever heard Hellfire and Brimstone sermons? And, and I'm not saying we should never hear those. But I'm saying we've got to be careful when we do them because the majority of those are fear-based and it's not glad tidings. It's not good news. I mean, the, the content of most of those sermons is if you don't change, you're going to hell. Well, that is factual. That is a, that is a true statement. So I can't argue the truth of your statement. But is there good news there? The good news of it is you don't have to go to hell. Yeah, that may be a fact. That may be where you're heading, but you don't have to do it. You don't have to end up there. What is our version of the gospel? Come to God, come join the family, and then you'll be just like us, miserable, depressed, have the same divorce rate as the world, be as sick as the world, be as broke as the world, and you don't get to have any fun doing it. Why would they want that God? Why would they want to change from the God that they already had? who does that same stuff to them. There's no motivation to do anything differently because our concept of the gospel does not contain good news or glad tidings. So we are not preaching the same gospel of the kingdom that Jesus preached. Look at what happened with the preaching of the good news of the kingdom. People were healed and delivered of all kinds of things. I'll submit this idea as one of the themes going into this session and others about the kingdom. When we correctly understand and present the kingdom, those things, healing and deliverance, will follow us as well. I'll say that again. When we correctly present the kingdom, healing and deliverance will follow us just like it followed Jesus, just like it followed his disciples, just like it followed the early church. The fact that we have not seen those things follow us means our concept, our definition, our presentation of the kingdom is wrong. Is everybody with me? The things that follow Jesus' presentation of the kingdom, healing and deliverance, will follow us as well. And if they're not, either God changed, which we know he doesn't, or we have not preached the same kingdom that he preached. I remember Nikki saying that 
when she goes to visit a Muslim mm -hmm. and, and the Imams welcome her, she that's what she she preaches Jesus the healer. Right. And thousands of people right. get healed and then see the kingdom and receive Jesus as their Savior. Okay, so I've given you one passage where Jesus preached the kingdom and followed him preaching the kingdom was healing and deliverance. I, I don't know about you, but one passage is not enough for me. So would you like a few more? Yeah. Hang on. <laughs> Mark 1, 14 through 15. Mark 1, 14 through 15. The NIV. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The message. After John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee, preaching the message of God. Time's up. God's kingdom is here. Change your life and believe the message. From the message. I like that. That's funny. This is Mark's account of the same thing before Jesus selected his disciples. This is Mark 1, 14 through 15. So just like we read in Matthew, he started preaching the kingdom. He picked his disciples. He sent them all out. We'll get to him, sent them out later. But the, the team went. Jesus continued to preach the kingdom. He saw healing and deliverance. So this is Mark's account of that same sort of scenario. John the Baptist was arrested by Herod. Now remember that John was Jesus' cousin. Some of us forget that. John was the one sent to prepare the way for Jesus. John was involved in actually starting Jesus' public ministry by being willing to baptize him. John was one of the first to identify Jesus as an adult and speak into his life. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. At that point in Jesus' life, there weren't too many people who had identified him as that or spoken into it. At least that we have record of. There have been more people, but in the scripture, that he's the first one that we have record of at this age. There are people that did it when he was dedicated at eight days old, and then you get a little bit more glimpse uh, when he was 12 in the temple. But now he's 30, he's ready to enter his public ministry, and those silent years between 12 and 30, we don't hear anything about what anybody said to him. Now he shows up, John's on the scene, John baptizes him, and John affirms him. Again, so I, I submit that Jesus had a fond place in his heart for John. That he was close to him, that he, he cared about him a lot. There are passages that support the idea that Jesus thought very highly of him. I don't have time to read those today, but you can read those if you want. What'd you go out to see? Uh, among those born of women, there haven't been one greater than John, but the least in the kingdom, which is an interesting verse, is greater than he. Anyway, he had a dear spot in his heart for, for John. John gets arrested. Now, does anybody remember why he was arrested? John? Uh, to my knowledge, he was only arrested once. Right. His Herod was uh, having an affair with his brother's wife or something like that. And he called, John called him out on it. So John was being righteous. He was being godly. He was being holy. He did the right thing when he called him out on it. Well, as the political power ruler in the place and, and not liking the fact that John called him out, Herod threw him in jail. It didn't help that the little nephew, the niece danced and got him all riled up and whatever. I'm not going there. Yeah. <laughs> She asked for his head. Yes. Yeah. Her mother said, give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter. So Herod arrests him to make that happen. And Jesus is probably upset by what's going on with his friend, his cousin, the one that had done so much to start his ministry. So that's the scenario in which Jesus does this. I could argue that Jesus wanted some revenge. Now, we don't think it's Jesus being vengeful. I think he was, well, he did, and that was a display of emotion, yes, but we, we view vengeance as such a negative thing. And Jesus took vengeance, but he didn't do it the way that most of us did it. 
Instead of going after Herod, who'd he go after? The spirit behind Herod. Jesus went after the root enemy and not the human representative. Okay, devil, you made a bad decision to start this fight. Now I'm going to make you pay for it. And he did so by going out into Galilee and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The good news of God. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So how did Jesus declare war? By preaching the kingdom. Do we view declaring the kingdom as warfare? No, we don't because our concept of the kingdom is wrong. How is declaring the kingdom warfare? At a surface level, yes. How do you know you were effective? We would say, well, how many people came and gave their life to the Lord? He says, how many people were healed? How many people were delivered? To what extent did the kingdom expand? Did what extent did the kingdom manifest? That's how successful my ministry of the kingdom was. That's the way I'm going to get my vengeance on this Yehu that started the fight and shouldn't have started this fight. We don't think like that. Oh, the devil's just beating on me. All oh, the devil's just picking on me. Make him pay for it. You don't have to sit there and take that stuff. Make him pay for it. If he is bothering you, he's not bothering somebody else, make him pay for it. The good news of the kingdom is the message of God in the message translation. Not a message of God, the message of God. So the good news of the kingdom is the message of God, singular. There's one message, and it's the good news of the kingdom. Does this sound like love and acceptance to you? No. You, you, that sounds like love? In, in the context of the guy at the parade wanting me to accept him and love him as he is? Okay. That, that's what I'm going, that, that's where this all started. Yes. 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 And the way you deal with that is the way that he's doing it. You go at the root of it. We recognize this as love and acceptance, yeah. even though it's not labeled that way because we've experienced what this brings into our lives in the forms of love and acceptance. But that guy at the parade that says love and acceptance, is he going to receive this as love and acceptance? No. This is not his concept at all of what he's saying that Jesus preached. So Jesus finds out about John. He declares war on the devil himself because the devil picked this fight. He goes out and he declares the kingdom. He starts preaching the good news, the message of the kingdom. He gathers his ministry team, just like we recorded in Matthew. Now drop down after he gathers the team. Verse 21 through 35. Mark 1, 21 through 35. Then they entered Capernaum. When the Sabbath arrived, Jesus lost no time in getting to the meeting place. He spent the day there teaching. They were surprised at his teaching, so forthright, so confident, not quibbling and quoting like the religion scholars. Suddenly, while still in the meeting place, he was interrupted by a man who was deeply disturbed and yelling out. What business do you have here with us, Jesus, Nazarene? I know what you're up to. You're the Holy One of God, and you've come to destroy us. Jesus shut him up. Quiet, get out of him. The afflicting spirit threw the man into spasms, protesting loudly, and got out. Everyone there was spellbound, buzzing with curiosity. What's going on here? A new teaching that does what it says. He shuts up, defiling demonic spirits, and tells them to get lost. News of this traveled fast and was soon all over Galilee. Directly on leaving the meeting place, they came to Simon and Andrew's house, accompanied by James and John. Simon's mother-in-law was sick in bed, burning with fever. 
They told Jesus. He went to her, took her hand, raised her up. No sooner had the feather left than she was fixing dinner for them. That evening, after the sun was down, they brought sick and evil afflicted people to him. The whole city lined up at his door. He cursed their sick bodies. Oh, oh, cursed. He cured. My bad. Sorry. He cured their sick bodies and tormented spirits. But the demons knew his true identity. He didn't let them say a word. And we're going to come back into this a few weeks from now for a different aspect. Even though it doesn't explicitly say that Jesus taught about the kingdom, I'm going to suggest that he did. And why would I suggest that? Same results as Matthew's account when he did talk about the kingdom. So is it likely that he did a different message this time and had the same results? It's possible, but not likely. Not if the message was the kingdom. Not if the purpose was the kingdom. And not if the manifestation of the kingdom was people being healed and delivered. He was demonstrating the kingdom. He was allowing them to experience the kingdom, not just mentally agree with what he taught about the kingdom. Okay, 121 through 28 through uh, the voice translation. Same passage, different version. They came at last to the village of Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee, and on the Sabbath day, Jesus went straight into a synagogue, sat down, and began to teach. The people looked at each other amazed because this strange teacher acted as one authorized by God. What he taught affected them in ways their own scribes' teaching could not. Just then a man in the gathering who was overcome by an unclean spirit shouted, the unclean spirit, what are you doing here, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I can see who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Jesus, in the process of rebuking him, be quiet. Come out of him now. The man's body began to shake and shudder, and then howling, the spirit flew out of the man. The people couldn't start talking about what they'd seen. People, who is this Jesus? This is a new teaching, and it has such authority. Even the unclean spirits obey his commands. It wasn't long before the news of Jesus spread all over the countryside of Galilee. Now look again at verse 22. The people looked at each other amazed because this strange teacher acted as one authorized by God. And what he taught affected them in ways their own scribes teaching could not. Were the people focused on the words that Jesus spoke? Are they commenting here, were they intrigued by the words that Jesus spoke? They were intrigued by the demonstration. They were intrigued by the fact that he had authority. They were intrigued by the fact that it was different than what they had heard before, just because, okay, you got a great new speaker here. He, he's very coherent. He can communicate. Very, no, 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 no. The difference was the demonstration that came with it. The difference was the authority that came with it. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things we always have to keep in mind that whenever Jesus spoke, it was supernatural. So anytime the scribe spoke, it was just basically reading the, reading the script. But Jesus spoke spirit to spirit. Good, yeah. And anytime somebody speaks spirit to spirit to you, you'll know it. Right. Because it's like, man, that, it bears witness. That's all. Right. It bears witness with our spirit. Yes. And we have the witness of that spirit. And that's why they said, man, this guy's different because it hit him right in the, you know, in the heart level, the spirit level. It's good. So he, he bypassed their head and, and went directly to the core of them. And the scribes couldn't do that. The, the religious leaders couldn't do that. That's good. I, I'm certain that some of these scribes were excellent communicators. I mean, they had been doing this for how many years? I'm sure some of them could, could articulate very, very clearly. It wasn't about the words at all. It was about what came with the words. No anointing, no demonstration. Notice that he acted like one, capitalized, authorized by God. He didn't talk like one authorized by God. Did you see that? What did it say? This strange teacher acted 
as one authorized. It didn't say he spoke as one authorized. He acted as one authorized. Yes. Uh, were his words good? Yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm, he had to be a very good communicator, but he wasn't relying on just that communication to get his point across. It was the spirit to spirit thing that Floyd mentioned. It was the demonstration of what he was talking about, the authority that he walked in, the things that happened around what he said because of what he said, the things that occurred in the room because he was just there talking. They acted as though they thought he could be the one, capitalized, the one. What's that a reference to? The Messiah. So they're thinking even at this early point in his ministry, this could be the Messiah. Why did they think that? Do what? The authority, kind of. What were they expecting the Messiah to do? A conqueror, a king, okay, yes. It also talked about he was going to uh, bring recovery of sight to the blind, that he was going to heal the brokenhearted, that he was going to uh, cast out devils, that he was going to deliver the people from the, all this other stuff that were things that he was supposed to do, not necessarily words that he was going to speak. Now, did they assume that he was going to be talking? Yeah. But they weren't looking for words. They were looking for all these other actions to be completed. When he did this. He did all that, yes. I'm not, I'm not saying that he didn't. I'm not saying at all that he didn't. I, I'm saying that he just didn't talk. Yeah. That there was more to him than just talk, than just words. And it was these other things besides, beyond the words, that led them to believe, hey, this could be the one. Because he acted like the one not because he spoke like the one. Go down to the end of the passage. This is from the voice also. The people couldn't stop talking about what they had seen. Who is this Jesus? This is a new teaching, and it has such authority. Even the unclean spirits obey his commands. It wasn't long before news of Jesus spread all over the countryside of Galilee. The people couldn't stop talking about what? Were they talking about a sermon? What they had seen. Not his words. I had a former pastor one time that said, yeah, I preach 52 life-changing messages a year and nobody's life has ever changed. I'm like, hmm. I'm like, ouch, and oh my, um, it just struck me when he said that. I'm like, okay, and how am I doing any differently with that? Are people's lives being changed because of what is said? Maybe. <laughs> no, I moved out of town. It wasn't. It wasn't for that. No. <laughs> He's also gone home to be with Jesus, so that could be the reason for the former. <laughs> But when he spoke to the things, they saw. Correct. Correct. That it moved them. <laughs> and and that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. If we just get up here and we do words week after week after week, it doesn't really matter how good the words are. Are people's lives going to be changed from the words? Uh, to some extent. Yeah, uh, but it's still going to be what you do with those words, more so than just the words themselves. But if we change this, if we got this right so that our words came with the demonstration, wouldn't more people's lives be changed sooner, faster, more efficiently? And isn't that the way it's supposed to be? Demonstration. I, I did not come with enticing words of man's wisdom, but a demonstration of the spirit and of power. Yeah. Well, it actually required both. Right. The Holy Priest, the gospel. Correct. So, what is our gospel 
that it doesn't demand that those things accompany it? How have we changed our definition of the gospel just to make it fit in 30 minutes, to make it fit in such a way that it's not politically offensive to anybody, that, that people will be willing to come back, that people get their fancy tickled and are not made uncomfortable We're, that's my point that's that's my point we as a group do not understand the kingdom we do not understand what jesus preached not the words but the whole idea that came with the words when he preached it so we've got a lot to learn i've got a lot to learn about the kingdom and what this all means and what this all involves We've got a bunch more verses. Let's go for a little while longer today, and then we'll re unhitch and regroup next week. Matthew 9, 35 through 38. Matthew 9, 35 through 38. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news, the gospel of the kingdom. So what is he talking about? The good news, the gospel, capital G, of the kingdom and curing all kinds of disease and every weakness and infirmity. When he saw the throngs, he was moved with pity and sympathy for them because they were bewildered, harassed and distressed and dejected and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is indeed plentiful, but the laborers are few. So pray to the Lord of the harvest to force out and thrust laborers into his harvest. Let me go back here. When he saw the throngs, he was moved with pity and sympathy for them because they were bewildered, harassed, distressed, dejected, and helpless. If Jesus looked at our churches today, would he, would he be able in, in large to reach a different conclusion? So we're in the same shape that this crowd was as he overlooked the crowd. By and large, Bewildered, harassed, distressed, dejected, helpless, no different from the rest of the world. So just picture him looking at our stuff, at, at the way we do things now, and saying, making the same statement. Now let's go on here to the end of it. In response to that, in response to what I'm seeing here, pray that the Lord of the harvest to force out and thrust laborers into his harvest. Okay, we need people to go and reap the harvest of evangelism. We need people to go out and win souls. We need people to, to go out and preach to the lost. Well, is it going to do any good to preach to the lost if we preach the same message that have left us helpless, dejected, distressed? We may get their ticket punched to heaven, but that's not going to do any good until we actually get to heaven. Jesus died for more than that. The message version of the same passage. Then Jesus made a circuit of all the towns and villages. He taught in their meeting places. He reported kingdom news and healed their diseased bodies, healed their bruised and hurt lives. When he looked out over the crowds, his heart broke. So confused and aimless they were, like sheep with no shepherd. What a huge harvest, he said to his disciples. How few workers on your knees and pray for harvest hands. So in his mind, what was the expected end result of teaching the good news of the kingdom? Healed, delivered, the people wouldn't be helpless, distressed, aimless, frustrated. None of those things would exist in the true representation of the people that had experienced the kingdom. Big harvest was also the end, end goal, end desire. How does this happen? The goodness of God leads to repentance. When someone proclaims good news about the kingdom, people get healed, people get delivered. Isn't that good news? You don't have to put up with that stuff. You don't have to put up with that sin. You don't have to put up with that back trouble. You don't have to put up with that uh, depression. You don't have to put up with this. You can be set free. Isn't that good news? How often are we hearing that? Amen. 
When someone proclaims the good news of the kingdom, people get healed and delivered. Is there any better manifestation of the goodness of God? Why wouldn't people want to serve that God? Instead, what do most people hear about God? God can heal you, but we aren't really sure it's his will to do so. God can deliver you, but he might be using this to teach you something. Come serve our wonderful God so that you can be just the same as us and act like us and do what we do, but without all the fun that you're having on the other side. What a marketing pitch. And we wonder why our campaigns are not successful. What are we missing? The good news part of this. Not just in theory, this will work, but okay, let's get you free. Let's get you healed. Let's get you whole. Let's expect the kingdom that we're in to manifest. There's another thing I'm remembering in my head. The kingdom of God is not meat or drink. But righteousness, peace, and, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Are you in joy bookers? Right. We'll see you that's good. No matter what situation you're in, and see that you don't lose your joy because you may not be happy every minute. Yeah. Where was this happening? Where was this verse happening? He taught in their meeting places. So would you, would I be safe to say that they had heard several messages in this same room, in this same building, in this same whatever? Before he, about he was talking yeah, about synagogue, was right? He, he just in this version, he just called it their normal meeting place rather than the synagogue. So they have heard some stuff in this room before. I wonder how different the message was this particular week compared to the hundreds or thousands of weeks before. Sometimes. Perhaps, yeah. I, I'm not, you're, you're probably right. It, it did occur to the extent that they understood how wrong they were. Right. Okay. Right. 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 Because the like the rabbis kind of showing them that you're not as good as me. So. So the, 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 even if repentance was preached, it was skewed, is, is what I'm saying. It, it wasn't the same repentance that Jesus preached from, okay, I've arrived, this is how this operates, versus I'm two steps ahead of you. You need to at least get to where I am before we can have a conversation. The people said that Jesus taught with authority, not like the typical religious leaders. Were these guys tapping into the harvest that was available? Their sermons, week after week after week after week, were they tapping into the harvest that was available? Are we tapping into the harvest that's available? Week after week after week after week. Some churches are doing better than others. Uh, thank goodness here we have very regularly people coming to give their lives to Jesus. Uh, that's awesome. Fantastic. What next? Mm -hmm. I think that's where you can get people have the in the moment and they want to get saved again the moment right and i'm not i'm not faulting us when i say it thank god that we're winning people to jesus so I, I am faulting. okay go ahead my question is how do you do because i, I mean even when i say stuff i, I want to make sure that I'm right to help people who want Coming to Jesus to strengthen, but not just coming to Jesus and then I don't know what's right. Next, so I want to make sure I'm doing it right and not being distracted. Okay, I'm going to answer you the same way that I, I feel like the Lord's speaking to me recently about this whole deal. Mm -hmm. This isn't about what you know. Your problem is you don't know the right things. Not knowledge. It's not me regurgitating knowledge. It's not me being able to answer, okay, go to this chapter and this verse to answer that question. It's me being able to demonstrate. Mm -hmm. And when you can demonstrate it and you teach people, okay, this is what should come next. You walk this out and you carry it so that it's demonstrated. It doesn't really matter how many questions you can answer. And this type of answer is far more effective 
than me giving you an intellectual answer from a chapter and verse. So that's where we're missing it. That's where I'm missing it. I haven't understood, okay, you're supposed to operate in the kingdom. What does that mean? If you are a citizen of the kingdom, how should your life be as a result of you being a citizen of the kingdom? And your life should be different than everybody else's. Go ahead, Brian. I want to go, you know, you asked what's next after you leave the life of Christ. And I know, um, I think for sure at one time the church followed up with a call to that person, and um, which I think is good. Yes. But it also takes, you're right, we should demonstrate what we're, exactly what we're talking about. Demonstrate the kingdom, show them by action and hands, and demonstrate it. Um, but it's also on that person to follow through with, you know, I, as someone who, uh, I would say this as a formal, former people pleaser, <laughs> who still struggles in the pockets, uh, I, I want to keep calling or, or going to that person and trying to get it right. right. You know, I, I get it. But it's it's also up to that person to to and God right change and right for them to take it you know to take that step because you can sit there talk and talk and talk and talk and and not get anywhere and you'll hear the same story from that person over and over again. Um, I think it's a wonderful gesture to to reach out to them, but it's also upon them. And help you pray that the that that light goes off and they're like, ah, now I see. So what should happen there, theoretically? Uh, we should have enough people in that capacity that are, are helping with that, that operate in the kingdom, that mentor them for a little bit. Okay, this is what the kingdom looks like. This is how you're supposed to live your life. See, I would say, because I would say, yes, coming to Jesus is a great thing. No. Everything is not going to be peace. Right. And that's the. the, the, the deal with my situation, yes. It's easier to call God and, and lean on Him. Yes. But we need to teach you how to do that. Okay. That, that's what I'm saying. After people are in the family now, okay, great. And we're going to give you our three week. And I'm not, I'm not slamming anything here. We're going to give you our three week introduction course to uh, what you can expect now. And then we just leave them hanging. Yeah. Right. They're not plugged into, okay, you're now a citizen of the kingdom. Here, you need to go over here and you need to learn what the kingdom is. We didn't have that class until now we have that class. <laughs> but, <laughs> and I don't want to brag on me about that, but what do we have for them after they get to that point? Yes. Church this size. Maybe you need to also visit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you need more. You need more responsibility. <laughs> I got to get my clone machine working, man. <laughs> okay. Jesus preached the kingdom, and these people get healed. These people get delivered. They're they're operating in kingdom rules, authority, even without them knowing what that consisted of they, they just suddenly start experiencing it that's a game changer that's a life changer right from the beginning even if they can the devil can trick you and lie to you and get you out of well you didn't really come forward you didn't really give your life to jesus if you get healed if you get suddenly delivered if your life suddenly changes in a significant way it's much harder for him to argue that away from you I, I look, devil. I don't know what you're telling me, but I know I, I had trouble walking when I came into that thing, and now I'm walked fine. Right. It's much more concrete when something has changed, not just the inside. And I'm not making light of the inside change. That's the greatest miracle that could ever happen. But we don't put it in the category of the greatest miracle that could ever happen. It takes some understanding, it takes some maturity about you before you realize. What all happened? What all changed the moment you gave Jesus your life? Huge miracle. A lot of stuff going on there. Thank God for it. I don't ever want to minimize it. But in our limited understanding at that time, 
that does not speak the same volumes as your body being healed. Same thing you said. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Right. Until somebody gets up and they gives their testimony about how that actually worked for them. It's the experiential side of it that is more lasting than the theoretical words that, I, that people can so often present. Okay, in this context, did Jesus care at all about more people? Just more people. What a huge harvest. He said, get on your knees and pray for harvest hands. Let me go back and look at one of these other ones. Uh, pray the Lord of the harvest to force out and thrust labors into his harvest. So did he care at all about more people? About, can he take anybody that just breathes to be part of his harvest team? And yet our churches do take anybody that breathes yeah. to be part of the harvest team. What kind of person was Jesus wanting on his harvest team here? Workers, Workers that would preach what? The, the gospel of the kingdom that they just entered. So pray that the Lord would send forth the correct kind of people that understand this, that operate this, so that they can have an easier time of bringing this harvest in than somebody that's just trying to do it with words alone. Right. One miracle in uh, Acts four, three, four, five, the, the guy at the gate beautiful. 5,000 people added in one day from one event. Yeah. Yeah. So when we do our evangelistic stuff, okay, we need to go out and get the word out that we're having this event. Okay, great. There's nothing wrong with that necessarily. But they come, they, they give their life to Jesus, and then it ends. And then we start these other problems that we're talking about these other deficiencies we run right square in the face of this other stuff that is still missing that's not in place yet and we're doing better than we have done historically I'm, don't get me wrong we're we're getting better about it but we still got a ways to go wouldn't it be a lot different if the sum total of your evangelistic crusade was to see the kingdom manifest you guys went to that uh conference or something last year do you remember any of the sermons that were preached <laughs> that's my point <laughs> right Th that's my point yes and you remember that it was good you remember that you, you grew as a result of it but it wasn't just because of what they said it was because of what you saw. It was because of what you experienced. Yes. Not necessarily the three points to their sermon. The biggest impact is what I saw. Right. But their sermons did. All right. All right. And their sermons explain, should explain, should give you the, the background, the reason for what you see. That's, that's how they should work together. Okay, this is what this says, and this is how we're going to operate it. And here, here we go. Right. Like the guy who, do what? Like the guy who was brought in by his friend, and how Jesus was like, you know, he wanted to heal. But it's like the message that he, even though he's already in the midst of preaching, the vision of it came. I just did it because he's in the middle of preaching, and they brought in this guy that was paralyzed, and then they talked to him, and then he's like, Oh, this is right. And we're going to talk about him in a, maybe next week or whenever. He, he's, he's on the list. You're ahead of your thing. But, but the point of this is what caused that crowd to gather that day? Him preaching, yes. But what did he preach? The kingdom with its demonstration. 
That was the thing that got the crowd there that day. And then he didn't even get started in a sermon good. He gets interrupted, and this guy ends up getting off the stretcher. And he still talks about the kingdom. We, in my lifetime, I have seen that. I saw that in Ron Roberts. I right. In Captain Coleman. I see it today in Andrew Woman right. and all the Garrett stuff. Right. If you want to learn all that stuff, you can do it online and all. You don't have to go to the university, but they're really teaching the kingdom. And and kingdom workers are going out all over the world, all over the world. Literally, they're teaching that. And again, just for me, me yeah. learning through this process, uh, I thought I knew what that meant. Yeah. But as it turns out, I didn't really know what that meant. Well, they see, and I certainly hadn't operated that way. And, yeah. 